Hello there, lovely people. It's Alex from Nintendo Life here, and today we're reviewing for you RZ the Jewel of Faramore for the Nintendo Switch. This review was originally written by the superb Chris Scullion and has been adapted for video by me. But anyway, that's more than enough waffling. Let's dive right into things. <laughs> cannot move for retro-inspired games these days to the extent that a developer saying, hey, this looks like an old game, has started to feel less like a selling point and more like a hop towards a crowded, pixelated bandwagon. If you're after something that looks a bit like a modern NES or SNES game, despite usually being the sort of thing those systems wouldn't actually be able to handle due to their limitations, you could just throw a rock at the Switch eShop and knock over about 12 of them with your first attempt. We doff our backwards baseball caps then to RZ The Jewel of Faramore, which manages to take the overused modern retro game concept and do something entirely new with it, even if it is slightly crazy to even consider doing something like this. You see, RZ is designed to look like a modern version of a game released for the Philips CDI. You know, that system Bill Gates once said was caught in the middle being a terrible game machine and a terrible PC. The system that bewilderingly ended up with a series of CDI games starring Nintendo characters after Nintendo's decision to ditch Sony and team up with Philips with the SNES era, if you know the story, you know the story, not going to go into details. Almost all of these games were just awful, although Chris is keen to point out that apparently Hotel Mario isn't that bad. But they were nevertheless the inspiration for RZ, which clearly borrows heavily from them, especially the two side-scrolling CDI Zelda games, Link the Faces of Evil and Zelda The Wand of Gamelon. The story follows our protagonist RZ as she travels through the land of Faramore in search of the five shards of a magic jewel that can give her the power she needs to defeat the evil King Daimur. Along the way, she meets a cast of colourful characters, the majority of whom are brought to life via the game's first CDI nods, the cutscenes. These are animated in a way that is astonishingly faithful to the CDI era, featuring deliberately crude drawings of the cast animated to over-the-top voice performances. If you've ever seen any of the countless compilations of Link the Faces of Evil cutscenes online, then you'll get an idea of what to expect here good. Get over the low-res nature of the characters, however, and you'll discover that these interactions are actually really quite well animated, meaning they manage to be both deliberately cheesy yet oddly accomplished at the same time. This same surprise extends to the gameplay itself. At first glance, it's an accurate recreation of the CDI-era visuals, albeit a far, far higher resolution this time, that you'd find in Wand of Gamelon and Faces of Evil, which, as opposed to the typical backgrounds you'd see at the time, they had these sort of, like, almost painterly style, like actually painted images. It was bizarre, but it definitely had a style all of its own. And then the developers came along and said, that's a platform, that's a wall, and sometimes it even worked. But largely, it was just confusing and awkward. Here, the backgrounds look similar, although the effect isn't quite as jarring because a lot of modern 2D indie platformers these days have these kind of elaborate worlds. More importantly, the platforming is a lot sturdier than it was in the CDI days, and although many elements are still similar to those two Zelda CDI platformers, right down to the way that the enemies leave the same red gems or rubies, yes with a B, it feels a lot better to play than those old games did. It can't be ignored, however, that one of the reasons developers often go down the pseudo 8-bit and 16-bit route is because it's a nostalgic reference point that so many players can relate to. Given that the CDI was a flop of titanic proportions, only around a million were sold worldwide, even the Virtual Boys sold more than that, those Zelda games are hardly the childhood experiences of millions of players like Nintendo's consoles were, so a number of the references here may fall flat. We're not entirely talking about the cutscenes here. I mean, the viral nature of YouTube combines with people's love for anything terrible means that the Zelda CDI games have been memed to death and back already, as has Hotel Mario, which is actually referenced in this game in a nice little bonus stage. It's pretty cool. It's more the other little nods to the CDI era, from the brilliantly accurate startup animation to the fact that Limited Run Games is selling a physical CDI controller for players who want an authentically uncomfortable experience experience. That's the sort of thing that is less likely to land with those not in the know. This goes for the soundtrack as well, which is on one hand a brilliantly authentic recreation of early 90s CD-ROM music, with the same dodgy electronic panpipes you heard in a bunch of multimedia discs and the low-quality CD games of the era. <music> 
eyewitness virtual reality cat, you're coming through in spades. Again, for those who get the reference, it's absolutely spot on, but it may fall flat for anyone buying the game without previous experience with the CDI. It's perhaps unfair to level criticism at the game for nailing niche references, however, for the audience that gets them, they absolutely hit the target. What's more important is that for the players who see these nods and winks fly directly over their heads, what's left is a solid enough platformer, if a kind of safe one. Combat is fine, the platforming is satisfying enough, and there's nothing overly majorly wrong with it. It's not without its issues, though. There are plenty of moments where you'll drop into what appears to be a safe area, only to find that it was a pit that kills you instantly. Infinite lives and generous checkpointing lessens the blow, but it's never not annoying when it happens. The game's non-linear progression can also be a bit of a problem at times, because there are occasions when it's not actually clear what you have to do next. Over time, you gain abilities which let you bypass barriers, but before that point it can be common to find yourself wandering aimlessly around, switching between the stages available to you in search of the section you're able to access next. Talking to NPCs will sometimes give you side quests which spell out more clearly where you have to go to next, but again, it's not always this clear. Ultimately, RZ is a game that is reasonable enough on its own merits, but with its fair share of issues that are easier to forgive if you're the sort of person who clicks with this attempt to offer a modern take on a CDI platformer. If the references fall flat, there are countless better alternatives out there. In short, RZ does a great job of aping the look and feel of the Zelda CDI games, but it relies on the player being familiar with them. Without that knowledge, what remains is a perfectly serviceable platformer, but one that isn't revolutionary in any way. If you're in on the joke though, it's just about worth sticking around. You've reached the end of the review, that means it's time for Alex's personal thoughts, and I have I have confused feelings about this game, but they are mostly positive. As Chris rightly said, if you're in on the joke and you understand the CDI games, there is plenty to love here, and it's just, it's chock full of them. And not every reference and joke absolutely lands, but overall, it manages to not fall into the trap that I thought it might, which was just, you know, being not self-aware enough, it's it's a difficult thing to get right, and thankfully, they've largely managed it. It's frustrating at points, but those frustrations kind of dissolve over time. Things like the combat feeling a bit stiff seems to sort of, it seems to get better as you go on. It's almost like you start off with a base CDI games, and then over time, it kind of evolves into a more modern game. I mean, only in terms of the way that it plays, but it's kind of interesting, and I can only assume that it was intended intentional. One thing that was a little bit strange for me, and this is more nitpicking than anything, is the variance in the cutscenes. Occasionally, one of the cutscenes wouldn't be as high a frame rate for some reason, and I don't quite know why, and there was an instance where I noticed that the cutscene was clearly 3D, and this happens every time you activate a beacon, but it also happens one time when you go back to the palace. Again, I'm nitpicking. It's not a big deal, but it is sort of like, oh, it, it, it kind of stood out to me, and that, that was a bit of a shame. What it boils down to, though, is that this game did entirely hook me. It did. You know, frustrations and all. If anything, sometimes the frustrations felt more like they were making it more interesting in a, in a bizarre way, in a sort of a strange retro manner that I can't completely put my finger on. And as a result, I completed this game to 100%. Uh, and there's not many games when I do that. And you know, if you said that I would be completing this game 100% before it was released, I would have probably said, ah, that's unlikely, but here we are. It feels strange to say that it completely enraptured me, but it completely enraptured me. If you know the CDI games, this game isn't going to disappoint you, and just, just like Chris said, it is entirely dependent on you knowing those games in order to get the most out of it. If you're not entirely familiar, you could probably give this a pass, but I have to give credit where credit's due. They set out to make a game inspired by the CDI games, warts and all, and by egg, they managed it.